Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And back today with another stock analysis for a company that's just joined the portfolio. And so we're gonna be talking about Liberty Global today. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, I would greatly appreciate you doing that now for the YouTube algorithm. And without further ado, let's get into it. So. Uh, if you're not already familiar, I'm a popular investor on eToro and I manage a uh, small uh, family fund. Today we're looking at the eToro portfolio, which is a very basic equities uh, fund where we're looking for value investments that will uh, protect and grow um, copiers, investors capital uh, over time. And I'm personally invested in the fund and it's uh, been a great run so far. If you are interested in asking about a particular uh, stock or, or asset, by all means, please put a comment in the comment section. We do get some great discussion. Without further ado, let's talk about the Crassus Investment Formula. So we're looking for, uh, looking for publicly listed businesses in this case with low debt, which is a, a nebulous term. I'll explain that uh, in detail today when it comes to Liberty Global. A margin of safety, sales growth, strong margins, free cash flow growth, and ideally share buybacks. I'm gonna talk about why uh, Liberty Global looks to, uh, to be a great value investment over time. It's not normally one that you would see me uh, look at, but particularly that criterion down the bottom there, share buybacks, is uh, a key part of what I'm interested in in terms of an investment thesis for the company. Okay, so let's take a look at some quick facts and we'll really need to dig in and explain these because otherwise they will look very, very ordinary and uh, like a, a rather mediocre business and investment. However, when you look uh, a little bit deeper below the surface, you might start to, to see uh, some diamonds in the rough when it comes to this business. So the revenue for 2022 is expected to come in at around 7.6 billion, EBITDA 2.9, Business is expected to stay flat to maybe very low single digit growth over the next decade, according to analysts. Now, I disagree with that, uh, but we, we can t touch on that later uh, in further slides. Current market cap, 12.7 billion, and an enterprise value of 26 billion. So right off the bat, that should tell us something that this business does have a lot of debt on the balance sheet. And so we need to really dig in and understand where uh, the potential risk might lie in that debt or whether it's um, not such a big deal. Share price at time of recording is $24.45 uh, American with 523 shares on issue. $1.6 billion worth of buybacks in the last 12 months and the company ha have committed to doing a further $1.5 billion over the next 12 months. The company have been buying back shares like absolute mad men and women and we're going to talk about why I think that makes this uh, a very interesting opportunity heading into the future. Return on capital is negligible, okay? It, it hasn't been a great decade really for these types of communications businesses and you're looking at 3% over the last 12 months, which is not normally investment grade. So there's a turnaround play. We're saying uh, the business is or has gone through the end of a cyclical decline and we are backing the management team to be able to turn the business around. We think it's got enough tailwinds and we think that it has a few upsides uh, that are potentially hidden. Net debt to EBITDA 3.4, so very high. It's coming down and going in the right direction, uh, but we're gonna talk about why in this case it's not so much of an issue. The debt is very serviceable and they have plenty of assets um, hidden in their subsidiaries, which would allow them to um, quickly sell off and pay down the debt. Okay, so normally over three, uh, I'm starting to lose interest, but I will go through and explain why I am interested in this particular company, even though the debt is higher than I would normally uh, prefer. Here's a look over the last, uh, or more than the last decade, over the last almost 20 years in terms of the price. And if we look out into, um, into the next few slides, we're really going to dig in as to um, why that's been the case, and why we don't think it's going, to, why I don't think it's going to be the case moving forwards. So, Liberty Global, what is that? It's a think of it as a holding company. It's a parent company with numerous subsidiaries, which provide mainly internet, telecom, five G, data networks, uh, and value add systems. Okay, they're, they're that type of uh, that type of player. They are evaluated broadband mainly for home systems, and so they do have some commercial applications as well. They provide public Wi-Fi to businesses such as hotels and bars. So you go down to the pub with your mates and you watch the UFC on a Sunday, and they're the guys that provide the Wi-Fi 
for the pub and a lot of their uh, other connections as well. They are mainly in the UK and some parts of mainland of Europe, okay? So it's a play more on Europe and the UK. And they have a JV with uh, Virgin Media in the UK. So Virgin is obviously a huge uh, and well-known brand. So they've got a 50% uh, interest in a JV uh, with the Virgin Media Company. Negative sentiments, uh, regulatory issues surrounding network providers. Okay, so in the past, there's been real issues over who's going to get the contracts, who's going to be allowed to operate rolling out um, fiber optic internet or 5G. Growth in debt has been used for CapEx to expand into the fiber and 5G network. So you ask yourself, is it going to be like uh, here in Australia, for example, we had the disastrous NVN rollout uh, where the the government wasted millions of, of dollars. And is it going to be the same that... Same story that here, for example, they rolled out the NBN and now we're, we're pretty much getting ready for 5G anyway. So it was a, a really a poorly uh, executed plan. If something new technology comes out that will eclipse the offering of Liberty Global, that will leave them in a, a right state, a right pickle, because they've spent a heap of capex um, to build out the, the necessary infrastructure for their offerings. Okay, so they're really banking that over the next few years, their capex will end. All that money that was spent on free cash flow in the past will uh, on free cash flow on capex in the past will be freed up to be returned to shareholders via dividends, acquisitions, R and D, or, or share buybacks. And so that's really the the play with this. And the risk that we run would be uh, some of these that I mentioned here. Uh, quickly touch on the fact that the company is very, very cheap. It's trading well below the industry average of 13 times free cash flow multiple. So even though the industry has gone nowhere really for a decade, you're looking at an, a, a median of 13 times the free cash flow. So that's what the investors in the public markets are willing to pay for free cash flows uh, generated from these types of businesses. Your risks with a company like this, regulatory surprises, nobody likes those. Um, if they decide to to privatize um, the 5G or data or something like something crazy like that, which you, I mean, given what's going on, who knows what can happen? It's an outside risk, but it is there. Inflation is a big risk, eating into the margins of the business. However, the company has been able to pass on these costs to the consumer, and it's it's something that's part of everyday life now. You need your Wi-Fi. Like I know, particularly, I just I don't even look at the cost for the Wi-Fi. I just say get. I say to my partner, get the best Wi-Fi we can and we'll, we'll just pay for it because we both use the internet for work, we use internet for entertainment and I'm sure you watching this are, are basically the same. You would prefer to pay more to have decent internet. It's just an inextricable part of our, our lives um, nowadays. So I think that that is a lesser concern for a company such as this. They do have pricing power. They do have the ability to pass on any increase in uh, input costs to consumers. An economic slowdown, on the other hand, might be a different story. And when when you're in a situation where the economy is starting to slow down and it's not as easy to get work and people are worried about their savings and so forth, you may see a decrease in spending on these network products. So instead of having the best internet product um, for British residences, for example, you might go for the the next tier down or the the most basic entry model and and cut back some of the spending. So that could affect margins leading out into the future. Perhaps currency risk, if you think of where they're geographically located, if the EU starts to run into further fiscal problems, uh, what's that going to mean for the currency? Uh, Right now at the moment, I'm actually enjoying the British pound to Australian transfer rate. So I'm selling a lot of options in my other fund on English uh, or UK listed um, assets. And so for every uh, every pound I'm earning, I'm getting a dollar ninety at the moment uh, in Aussie dollars. So just something to keep an eye on. It can work for you, it can work against you. And I think if you were an American-based investor, you wanna watch this closely. If you think that the pound or the euro um, is going to uh, continue to fall against the US dollar, and obviously the company's got earnings in both pound and euro, you would wanna keep a closer eye on that than than I necessarily. And the tech disruption. So if there's some whiz bang new mode of Wi-Fi communication uh, that comes in over the next few years, that's obviously gonna fare very poorly for a company uh, such as Liberty. And yeah, we're coming off the back of a, an ordinary decade where sentiment is in the gutter and if you're a, a long, 
or a, a speculator that wants to position yourself uh, long uh, on a, a given investment, obviously it's uh, the perfect contrarian play. Future prospects. So they are aggressively investing into their infrastructure. So they really believe in in the turnaround story. They want to bring 5G to domestic and commercial customers. Okay. And I think that would be, I, I think that has a lot of potential. If you think of people wanting to get on the 5G networks in home, if, if these guys can essentially own the racehorse and, pro, and provide the infrastructure for that to happen, they'll be uh, really sitting pretty in a, a great position. They do appear, as I mentioned, to have pricing power and the scale to combat uh, inflation thus far. Subsidiaries give the company a strong hidden book value, and that's very important. So um, uh, UBC and, and one of their Swiss companies uh, was bought for $7 billion only a few years ago. So you think about a company with a, a market cap of $12 billion at the moment, 12.7, with you know one of their, their holdings being worth roughly $7 billion on its own. I mean, it, that takes the debt uh, equation uh, almost out of the picture entirely, and it gives us a really good uh, margin of safety. If we know that we're buying a whole heap of companies for 12.7, and we know that at least one of them is worth roughly ballpark figure of $7 billion, someone's actually paid that uh, for the company in the past, we're getting an awful lot of... Uh, excess uh, value for the other companies uh, which Liberty own. As the industry and individual stock is depressed, the market may well assign much higher multiples on the back of buybacks and if the industry starts to, or the sector starts to turn around. So if we start to see the company execute and pay down their debt, get through to call it 2023, 2024, where they've built out this infrastructure successfully, then once they've done that, they don't need to keep doing that. They don't need to keep uh, laying new uh, fiber pipelines and cables every year. Once it's done, it's done. And they can sit back and start to receive a lot more of that, uh, what was CapEx as free cash flow, and the market will be willing to pay more for that. You take away the debt, you take away a lot more of the risks and investors will be willing to, to pay. If you go back over the previous highs, um, you can get up to, to 20x uh, multiples of the free cash flow. So if we get this perfect scenario, and this would be a theme if you've been watching the videos where we're looking at a company that's had some troubles that the market doubts that we think, or that I think, should be able to service their debt, at least in the near term, pay it down, clean up the balance sheet, execute on the plan, then all of a sudden you're going to have paying down the debt, increasing the earnings of the free cash flows, and the market re-rating the stock and paying more for those now increased and improved uh, quality cash flows. You get the, the holy trinity and uh, potentially buybacks on top of that, the holy uh, quaternity, I don't even know what that is, uh, the quadrilla, then you, you'll really be uh, looking at down the barrel of a good investment. Not saying it's always going to happen in everyone that we pick, but we're looking for that as a potential opportunity into the future. Buybacks uh, on adjusted growth are likely to be 10 to 12%. So the company's growing at roughly 2%, maybe 3% in line with the broader economy, as analysts uh, have estimated. They're buying back about 10% of their entire float since 2019. So every year they are trying to buy back 10%. The, the management have said this in the quarterly reports that they want to buy back 10% of the entire stock. That is very, very good for investors. Uh, if they can clean up their balance sheet and they can shrink the shares, their earnings don't have to grow that much. Why? Because if you've got a dollar of earnings and it only grows to a dollar five, but that denominator shrinks from say one to half, your, earning, your earnings power uh, essentially has doubled, okay? So if you're getting rid of the shares, you're getting you're lowering the denominator over which those earnings will be divided. So you're getting a greater piece of the pie every year simply from the fact that management are buying back uh, so much of their stock. Could be a 20% uh, CAGR uh, in terms of return on investment if we start to get the turnaround, the company executes, and the market re-rates it. So I'm not saying that's our base case. We're just saying we do have that as a a possible upside. So the way I look at it, here's my sort of quick thesis in a in a slide. Okay, the company is generating cash of 1.7 billion uh, at a market cap of 12 billion. So on the back of your envelope, you write down, okay, we're paying 12 bill. I'm getting 1.7. That's about a 14% yield. We know the company's got a lot of debt though, so we need to look at the enterprise value. So if we add the enterprise value in. 
the cash that we receive versus the enterprise value that we're paying, so the market cap plus the debt because the company's encumbered, we're looking at about a 6.5% free cash flow yield, which is not bad in today's low interest rate environment. This is the key. So if you delve in, the debt is fixed for six to seven years. That is good. That gives the company a lot of time to pay it down. And if we get inflation as I inspect, uh, I expect, the real value of that debt will fall, okay? Because the interest rate doesn't change. Inflation uh, starts to rise through to consumers. They can pass that cost on. So the nominal uh, earnings and the cash flows will increase and it'll make it easier to pay down that debt. So that's a very important point. CapEx, as I've mentioned, will drastically reduce once the infrastructure is complete, okay? Once you've built a, a road, you don't have to keep building it every year. You can sit back and, and collect the tolls, so to speak. And that's a great metaphor for what I believe Liberty's trying to do. It leaves much more uh, free cash flow for buybacks, uh, etc. We've spoken about that ad nauseum. And I'm going to harp on it here because it is really the, the key piece. If it didn't have this, I wouldn't invest in the company, to be honest. The buybacks the company is aiming for is 10% of the shares on issue, as I've stated. Okay, so this is, this is effectively a short squeeze is what I'm looking at of saying, if you've got the short interest at 10% compounding every year, and you know you, you take into account the growth of the free cash flows at two to three percent, it's it's like the company's getting short squeezed, twelve to thirteen percent year on year compounded if they can keep it up, okay, um, which I think puts a tremendous support pressure under the the stock price. I think we're going to see uh, a, a really strong level of support provided the management continues to execute on this type of plan. Because why wouldn't they? I mean, if it's if it's reducing the share count that much, the relative earnings and the cash flows is, can mathematically can only go one way in that scenario. The question will be how much should be devoted to buybacks versus paying down the debt. So that's a, another topic you may wish to consider. And therein lies the risk of the company. But with the debt fixed for six to seven years, I, I, think, it's, I think it's difficult for the company to, to run into too much trouble. And I think the risk is, has been more than been priced into the current stock price. If you look at, as I mentioned, since 2019, the company seems to have delivered on that promise. Uh, so they, they've given uh, given up 20% of the shares on issue. Uh, they've been repurchased since 2019. So here's what they're looking to do. So they hold the number one or two position in every market that they own, okay? With a lot of their uh, mobile carry providers. They're looking to scale and synergize and strong organic growth and optionality and all the stuff that you see in basically all corporate uh, quarterly reports. Tailwinds should continue to drive free cash flow and shareholder value. And um, year on year, they seem to have done very well. As you can see, they're 36% increased in adjusted uh, free cash. They've got a lot of optionality on these other little venture businesses. So much like Overstock have a 99% uh, interest in Medici Ventures. So you've got all these little things that one of them could shoot to the moon and you, you'll you make back your investment. Similar type of thing, although not as good a book, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to Liberty. They've got a bunch of these tech and content uh, little companies. And if you add up the value of all those companies, they've been valued at 3.5 billion, okay? Or $6.70 per share. So if we're paying 24 bucks a share and we know that the company's got all these little things worth about six, call it $6 a share. The effective real price is you're paying about $18 for that value and then you look at what cash flows you've been getting back. So if you were to go through and, and do that, you'd start to see that enterprise value um, yield increase, okay? Just another way of looking at it. Shareholder value creation, levered equity model with long-term fixed rate debt. That's fantastic if you can pull it off in a good environment. It is a disaster if you can't. Anchored by strong free cash flow. That should be enough to um, to get the company through. A lot of theirs is a subscription user business that like you're paying for your phone plan every month, you're paying for your internet every month. And so the, the debt service coverage ratio, uh, I'm quite happy with uh, personally. Stock buybacks targeting 10% of shares per annum. That is I actually don't think I've ever seen that in a quarterly report that they've literally committed to that. Uh, and um, it's going to be great if they can pull it off. $4.3 billion uh, cash balance, okay, which is uh, enough liquidity on hand to be able to, 
to weather any unforeseen near-term storms. Okay, here's a look at the, the Ventures book that they have. So they've increased their value, as we've said, 3.1 billion to 3.5 billion. It works out on roughly they've added another value, a dollar per share in value in terms of the Ventures book. And 1.6 billion in buybacks uh, in 2021. We'll continue to continue to roll that out into the future at roughly 10% of float. So I'm sure I have harped on that quite enough and you get the point. But that there gives you a good history as to the company, they mean business, okay? They, they say what they mean and they execute on what they say, which is very important to know when you're investing in a turnaround because basically everything I'm wanting to occur hinges on management's ability to, to get the job done. So let's take a look at a base, uh, a bull and a bear case for the company. Again, this is purely what I think the company can do. Growth rates, uh, you'll see here for the base case, 10% over the next uh, five years, 3% after that. And then if they can keep a very consistent 9%, so even if they drop on the bottom line, but they keep buying back the shares, and you'll see these multiples are super duper conservative, guys. Okay, so you could you could reasonably argue, you could say, well, 10 and 3 is far too low. You said 2% uh, top line and 10% buyback, so 12 to 13% over the next decade. And no way, four times uh, EV to EBITDA is not appropriate. It needs to be more like eight. Uh, and that would be reasonable. Uh, I'm just taking a really conservative uh, view and allowing for negative growth in the near term in case we get some of those disruptions that I uh, mentioned. Apply to 60, uh, 20, 20 percentage probability. And as you can see here, the shares outstanding have not changed. The share reduction has been somewhat uh, attributed to frontline growth. Okay, so you could do it either way, um, but it's much easier to present in this format. EBITDA and cash flow, so in order to, to get our 20% return, so I've used 20% as a discount rate, you would be looking at an intrinsic value of roughly $30.67, okay? Two thirds margin of safety is about $20, and do you need a two thirds when you've already gone through and been conservative with your numbers, given a, a bear case and a base case, and you've also used a 20% discount rate? Possibly not, uh, but I'd put it here for reference. For me, I'm quite happy given the, the buybacks that are, are coming down uh, the pipeline for this year and that the company is going to continue to do that year on uh, year on year, then $30 is a reasonable price. If I can buy it at $24, I'll start to scale in. And if it starts to drop, hopefully below $20, I can really start to be more aggressive in terms of entering a, a position. If we extrapolate using a, a base case for growth, here's our EBITDA on a per share basis. Here's the entry price that the market's asking for the company shares today, discounted at the cost of capital. Okay, so if this were all to, to play out and we paid the price today, we're looking at an IRR of almost 30%. So very, very strong IRR, and certainly at a, an acceptable investment level, if you're comfortable with the debt, okay? Same deal, uh, just done for free cash flows, discounted at cost of capital, and you're looking at around about uh, a 20% suggested IRR. Okay, so both cases, uh, a strong case for the turnaround play if you believe that management can in fact turn the business around. So here's a summary. The verdict is that I'm looking to accumulate and scale in personally. It's not a recommendation, it's just what I'm doing. To recap, the company does not really have low debt, but they do have low debt serviceability, okay? So they, they're able to service their debt quite comfortably, and they have assets which they can sell if they needed to further um, pay down the debt. And they could do that quite quickly through selling one or two of their subsidiaries. There is a margin of safety in the sense that I just mentioned, the subsidiaries, okay? The book value, the net asset value is worth uh, a lot more than the enterprise value and you have a margin of safety in the sense that they are gonna buy back a hell of a lot of stock over the next few years. Sales growth is there, but it is very weak, okay? Single digits is all I would expect. Margins, uh, they're positive. I wouldn't say they're strong necessarily, but they are there. 
what makes again what makes up for that fact is the fact that they're cannibalizing all those uh, outstanding shares free cash flow growth is there I wouldn't say it's strong again but it will be strong on a per share basis uh, due to the repurchases and as I've uh, basically talked about for 25 minutes the share price uh, or the share buybacks is really what it's all about for this company so I would love to get exposure into the network and infrastructure space. I would like to do it with Liberty if I could. There are a couple of other guys I've got my eye on. I would aim to add to this company till it's about three to 5% of assets under management, but I would want to see the share price pull back under 20 before I really commit and pull the trigger. Okay, thanks for watching. Uh, if you haven't already checked out the portfolio, jump on eToro and you can either add us to a watch list or you can um, Add some funds in and start copying the portfolio yourself, should you choose. Please like and subscribe the video and hit the notification bell so that you're kept up to date with any new uh, videos uh, that I do. And as always, disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know you or your personal uh, situation. This is just what I'm doing. It's my opinion. I could be wrong on this stuff. You need to bear that in mind. Please don't mistake anything for advice uh, on this channel or in this video because it's not. As I said, it's just my opinion, I'm fallible, and it's what I'm doing and with my money and the money that I manage. Does not mean it's necessarily appropriate for you. So please make sure you get the appropriate advice. And having said that, I hope that you got some value out of the video and enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you in another video shortly.